Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is Tim Harford, the Financial Times journalist whose first book, The Undercover Economist, has sold over a million copies. That book showed readers the invisible economic underpinnings of everyday life. Tim's second book, The Logic of Life, is out now in paperback and I met Tim in a crowded cafe recently to find out more about it. He writes about how humans much of the time behave in a way which could be called rational. But, I asked, that doesn't mean that they're like Mr Spock, doing a cost-benefit analysis of every decision, from buying a tumble dryer to getting married. Yes, Mr Spock is is not just a Vulcan, he's also a straw man. You often hear people say, well, people don't behave like in the textbooks, and as though they've discovered something absolutely fascinating and original. Economists know that. The rationality that I'm talking about is quite pragmatic. I'm certainly not saying that people are infallible. I'm not saying they're never subject to temptation, they never make mistakes. Clearly, all these things are true of real human beings. What I am saying is that we are surprisingly good at weighing up costs and benefits, at weighing up risks and rewards in in quite unexpected situations. I don't think it's especially controversial to say that um, we think about costs and benefits when we're going shopping. But to say that we, we think about costs and benefits when we're deciding whether to have unprotected sex, or we think about costs and benefits when deciding how to behave on a speed date, that I think is a more interesting statement. So I'm not making some dramatic statement about the fact that we're all supercomputers because we're not. What I'm saying is that costs and benefits impinge on our lives in unexpected ways. And that's not a, an assumption of economics. People often say that's what economists assume. In the logic of life, that's data-driven. You know, it's sure, we have this view that people are mostly rational, and then we go and we test it, and we see, and the logic of life is all, all about the evidence. And you've mentioned sex already in the first couple of minutes of our discussion, and the book begins with a discussion of, of oral sex amongst American teenagers, which I think clearly indicates that this is, this is a book which, which casts its net very wide and shows that economists have moved far beyond whether we buy a, a new tumble dryer or not. Yes, I don't talk about the, the oral sex example when I give speeches about the book, but I did want to begin with it, not just because, well, sex sells, let's be honest, I know that, but it's actually the perfect illustration of the hypothesis of the book, because you have the so-called oral sex craze that America is up in arms about, and actually you get quite a lot of writing about it in the UK as well. Oprah Winfrey is concerned, the New York Times are concerned, and all sorts of, I think, very lazy hypotheses about this, this oral sex craze. So it's because of pornography, and it's because of the sexualization of society. So all I did was to look at the evidence. And the evidence is, well, yes, oral sex is a lot more prevalent, but at the same time, kids are losing their virginities later. And when they have protected sex, they're more likely to protect themselves with a condom than they are to protect themselves with a pill. So you add all that up and you say, well, that's not an oral sex epidemic. That's a safe sex epidemic. And that's a rational response to the increased risks of AIDS. So there's your, there's your theory. And then the question is, well, what's the data? And the real data comes from seeing the differential response of teenagers across the US when different American states, you've got 50 American states, they've all got different legal systems, different American states introduce restrictions making it harder for teenagers to have abortions, but they don't make it harder for adults to have abortions because they can't, constitutionally they can't. And when they do, what they've done is raise the cost of unprotected sex. And what happens? Well, we don't know how people change their behavior, but we do see the effects. And the effects are that the infection rate, the sexually transmitted infection rate amongst teenagers in those states that introduce those abortion laws falls relative to the adult population. So add it all up. You've got laws which are introduced in a few states which specifically make it more risky for teenagers to have unprotected sex. And the response, but not adults, and the response is that teenagers, but not adults, seem less likely to acquire sexually transmitted infections. And then tell me again that we're not really seeing a safe sex epidemic. We do respond to incentives. Now, one area of human activity where it seems as though this rationality, even if it's sort of an unconscious rationality, might bump up against explanatory problems is the area of addiction. 
and you know there's alcohol addiction, drug addiction, nicotine addiction, gambling addiction. If if we've got this sort of internalized model of of, of rational behaviour, how come so many of us have so many addictions? I think clearly the pure Mr. Spock view of rationality doesn't leave any space for any anything called an addiction. You can't have an addiction, right? You, you either you smoke because you like smoking or you don't smoke because you don't like smoking. But you you don't have temptation, you don't have people who want to quit but don't quit. So we're clearly more complicated than that. But here what really interests me is that there still seems to be an important underpinning of rationality in the way we get addicted. So the clearest sign of this is the way we respond to predicted price rises. So if the price of cigarettes is going to go up next year because the government says, well, I'm going to raise taxes on cigarettes next year, what we see is a fall in smoking right now. Now that's very hard to explain. If you have a totally, um, a totally irrational addict, they're not going to respond to price changes. But if you have somebody who's not addicted at all, well, they don't respond to price changes in that way either. They say, well, I'm going to smoke more now, and when the price of cigarettes goes up, I'll smoke less. That's the rational thing to do. Instead, we get somebody who is a rational addict, somebody who's addicted, knows they're addicted, and thinks about the costs and benefits of that, who says, the price of cigarettes is going to rise. It's going to get more expensive. I should start quitting now, because it's not going to be easy. And the more I smoke now, the harder it's going to be able to quit, to, to quit in future. And that's how people behave when they smoke. It's how people behave in response to increase in uh, taxes on gambling. It also seems to be the way that drinkers behave. One of the fascinating things I discovered in writing the book, which is very relevant to Sir Liam Donaldson's proposal to have a minimum price for alcohol, is that when alcohol taxes go up, consumption of alcohol falls, that's not a big surprise, but extreme consumption of alcohol seems to fall more. So cirrhosis of the liver falls much more dramatically than overall alcohol consumption. So it's, it's the problem drinkers who are the ones who are cutting back more. Actually, when you take a step back and think about it, that makes sense. Two types of problem drinkers, people who drink a lot, and people who are young and binge. And both of them are, don't have enough money to afford all this drink. And so they are price sensitive.